Uh, ladies and uh, <laughs> no. uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Michael Rosen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this meeting of the Political Theory Colloquium being held in the conjunction with the programme on constitutional government. We're always uh, very happy to welcome all of our colloquium speakers, but it's a particular pleasure and source of pride to welcome back someone whose trajectory has taken them through the Harvard Government Department, and that's the case with uh, Rita Kogansson, or Rita Kogansson as I prefer to call her, uh, <laughs> who took her PhD from Harvard in 2016. She teaches at the University of Virginia in the Department of Politics, and uh, she's also the Associate Director of the Programme on Constitutionalism and Democracy. Uh, her research work has centred on uh, authors from uh, classical political thought tradition and uh, focused on questions of childhood, family, and education, which, as she points out, constitutes a standing problem for liberal political theory. Um, I think we might disagree. I think it's because it's a standing problem for all political theory. But whether it's a problem then, as, so especially for um, liberal political theory, well, that might be something we'd like to discuss later. Uh, I'd also uh, recommend to you, as well as her um, writings as an academic researcher, she has an active career as uh, a more public author. Uh, and uh, if you look at her excellent writings, she makes us speciality of challenging ruling pieties. And uh, this paper, those of us who've uh, read it will know, um, uh, combines both of those features. It's Sophie is not oppressed, sex, education, and freedom in Rousseau's Emile. And she will introduce it now for 20 minutes yeah, or so, or so. Uh, before or, or more or less. And after that, we'll uh, open things up for discussion. Okay. okay. Um, so my paper begins from two not obviously connected questions. So the first is, what is the relationship between uh, the Emil and Locke's book on education, some thoughts concerning education? And then the second question is, why is book five of Emil so strange? Uh, so I'm not the first person to think that book five of Emil is somewhat strange. If you go on you know, any book review site, especially Goodreads for some reason, but Amazon too, uh, and you look at the reader reviews of Emil, uh, which you should probably not do, so I'm going to summarize them for you right now, you find dozens of angry undergraduates who have been assigned Emil for their classes, ranting about how shocked and horrified they were by book five. Uh, how, after all his talk about the importance of nature and freedom in Emil's education, Rousseau just turns around and demands for women in education in basically artifice and oppression. So why do all these undergraduates think this? Well, it turns out that it's because Rousseau explicitly tells us on so almost every other page of Book 5 how oppressive and artificial women's education should be. Uh, so you know, he says women are basically designed for the, the pleasure of men. He says women, woman is made to yield to man and to endure even his injustice. Her duties are great and difficult. All their lives, they will be enslaved to the most continual and severe of constraints, that of the proprieties, and so on. So the angry undergraduates have not actually had to do a whole lot of interpretive legwork to arrive at their conclusions. <laughs> right? Rousseau is, is very expressive about this conclusion. But it's hard to square Rousseau's cheerleading for artificiality and oppression with practically anything else that he's written. Um, so perhaps some more interpretation is necessary here. In the first place, it's generally imprudent to give one's readers so many vivid and explicit warnings about your intention to oppress them if you intend to carry that intention through. Uh, for another thing, it may make sense to argue for the natural, or I think in Rousseau's case, acquired complementarity of the sexes, which requires differentiating them. But differentiation doesn't require inversion. So when Rousseau says that man is like the hand and woman is like the eye, they're both none the, the less useful and necessary parts of the body. Uh, sexual complementarity doesn't require or mean that one sex has to be free and the other has to be slave to public opinion. So perhaps something more is taking place in Book 5 than the straightforward description of the female sex and her educational needs, its educational needs. 
Then there's the relationship with Locke. So scholars have not really had a lot to say, a great deal to say about this, at least in, um, in English scholarship, uh, English language scholarship, despite Rousseau's own frequent invocations of Locke's book throughout Emile. Those who have addressed the relationship have tended to view it as oppositional, with Rousseau writing mainly as a critic of Locke. And that's a reasonable interpretation of Rousseau's position in books two through four, where after approving of the basics of Locke's physical education and in infancy, uh, basically every other invocation of him by Rousseau is a criticism. Um, <clears throat> but what's striking about book five is that it actually largely recapitulates Locke's education only with Sophie as the student rather than Emile. Uh, the concession to Locke turns out to have a great deal to do why, with why Sophie's education is described as oppressive and artificial. At the same time, I think it also in the end partially vindicates Locke and is intended to do that. So Locke's education is, on Rousseau's account, both unnatural and oppressive in a certain way. It is also, for related reasons, feminizing. But we have to recall that originally in the second discourse, Rousseau had already described civilization itself as a process of softening and feminizing. While this is in some ways a loss, it's also irreversible and it's not straightforwardly condemnable because it also opens new possibilities. Moreover, Emile is a book that's written as an attempt to accommodate civilization and to try to recover or discover a self-consistent way of life within it rather than reject it for alternatives like the perfected republic of the social contract um, or the solitude of his last works. Rousseau says he sets out to educate a man who is useful to himself and to others. And given that Emile and Sophie must live in a soft and effeminate society, it's not altogether strange that Rousseau would recommend an education for it that is also soft and effeminate. Sophie's education is what can be done for women, and I will argue for men, uh, without leaving society or fundamentally altering the regime. But the apparent inferiority of her education to Emile's that has outraged so many readers is not accidental either. Rousseau doesn't recommend Sophie's Lockean education without reservations. So the reservations that he has about Locke are contained in Emile's education, which is you know, books, the second half of book one through the end of book four. Uh, and they rest on two central objections to Locke's sort of philosophical presumptions. Rousseau alleges that Locke misunderstands the nature of the will and that he misapplies authority to direct the will. He agrees with Locke that the common methods of parenting tend to exacerbate what Locke calls a child's love of dominion, uh, <clears throat> and that must be counteracted. But he disagrees with the cause of this love. Locke argues that the child who's coddled and obliged constantly by his parents comes to have an outsized idea of his own strength and power, and that's what needs to be counteracted in him. Rousseau says that it's actually the child's sense of his own weakness relative to adults that enrages him and goads him to try to dominate them. So Locke recommends suppressing the child's will and substituting one's own will until the child becomes so accustomed to having his desires crossed that he can cross them himself. Rousseau instructs a tutor to ensure that the child never feels other people's wills at all and that he perceives everything that happens to him as following from natural necessity. The perception that the world is governed wholly by this kind of impersonal necessity uh, allows a tutor to delay introducing moral ideas which the child is not capable of understanding. There is no will in the world, only necessity for Emile. Locke, by contrast, begins from moral ideas and he tries to educate the will by means of admiration and disdain, love of praise and hatred of blame. Everything is will and the only way to deal with the power that other people's opinions have over us is to develop enormous control over one's own will, self-mastery. And that's the, the central virtue of Locke's education. So to educate according to Locke's pedagogy <laughs> requires the imposition of adult authority from the outset. The child must be brought to love and to admire his parents uh, and to seek their praise and to try to avoid their blame. But for Rousseau, that's a form of, of tyranny. The child could not have consented to his parents' authority at so young an age because he lacked reason. And so there is no legitimate basis for what they're doing. Although, of course, Emile's tutor orchestrates every detail of his life and manipulates him into doing everything that he wants him to do, Emile never perceives this as authority uh, and he's made to feel that all of his actions are purely voluntary. So the tutor is up until at Emile's adolescence supposed to be perceived as a mere companion 
And Rousseau says, you know, it would, it would be ideal if he could even be the same age as Emile. But of course, that would be logistically impossible. Uh, only once the revolution of puberty begins and Emile is introduced to moral ideas, can he comprehend the tutor as a legitimate authority and consent to him. So by reversing this relationship and imposing authority on the young child and relaxing that authority in adolescence, Locke in effect makes his pupil a slave to his parents' wills. That, at least through book four, is Rousseau's philosophical criticism of Locke's pedagogy. It's internally self-contradictory and it departs from Locke's own presuppositions about human nature. But then in book five, we meet Sophie, who is taught self-mastery from the earliest childhood and who is explicitly subjected to her parents' authority at that point as well. Uh, she's brought to admire her mother and to wish to imitate her. And the argument that Rousseau makes is that girls should be raised to negotiate public opinion and to understand the nature of reputation because their adult happiness will depend on these skills. He says, when a woman acts well, she has accomplished only half of her task, and what is thought of her is no less important to her than what she actually is. Opinion is the grave of virtue among men and the, its throne among women. But although Rousseau claims that in her conduct, woman is enslaved by public opinion, Sophie's education, like Locke's, is aimed at teaching her to resist opinion's power over the mind. Uh, before exposing them to theatrical di displays, uh, Rousseau warns parents to arm these girls well against the illusions of vanity and to oppose the empire of public prejudice. So the goal here is no different than what the tutor wants for Emile, only it's accomplished in the opposite way. To Sophie, it's admitted that public prejudice is a permanent and omnipresent feature of society, and she's forced to confront and to understand it in order to overcome it. For from a meal, the very existence of public prejudice is hidden for as long as possible so that he never develops any desire to appease it. Girls are, are to be gratified in their desire to attend the theater but armed against its sentimental seductions. That is, they are to be made capable of suppressing and controlling their desires, just like Locke's pupil. A meal is not to develop any desires requiring suppression in the first place and so is not permitted to attend the theater until he's already grown. In short, girls are from the first to be brought to understand both themselves and how they appear to others, to understand themselves in relation to others, while boys are to understand themselves in relation to the physical world and to remain until puberty essentially indifferent to others. Since these girls will become mothers under the same social conditions in which they were educated, they're in a much stronger position than their male counterparts to inoculate their own children against the seductions of fashion and opinion, since it's Sophie and not Emile who understands how fashion works on men. She is the one who has studied the sources of human judgment and the passions determining them and has learned to weigh the opinions of others against her own conscience. The opinions of others have little weight for Emile, but his very indifference makes him insensible to the authority that opinion has over others and incapable of recognizing the urgency of educating his own children against it. Given that Rousseau says Emile and Sophie will be responsible for educating their children, Sophie's education also illuminates something else. Emile's education is not compatible with the continuation of his own family. Indeed, the shortcomings of Emile's education as a basis for governing and teaching his own children are made apparent when, in book five, upon learning that he is to become a father, he begs the tutor to continue to govern him and his family. The problem of raising the couple's children brings us back actually to book one. We should recall that book one does not actually begin with Emile and his, this imaginary child and his imaginary tutor, Jean-Jacques. Although they're the central characters in the book, they're actually introduced only as a kind of regrettable alternative to the, family, to, uh, the education of the family in the home. Uh, that's what Rousseau describes as superior to any education by a tutor. The book, he says, is addressed to the tender and foresighted mother and begins by exhorting her to nurse her own child while the father is encouraged to educate him. The pedagogical re prerequisites are also much lower for parents than for tutors. Rousseau says, as the true nurse is the mother, the true preceptor is the father. He will be better raised by a judicious and limited father than the cleverest master in the world, for zeal will make up for talent better than talent for zeal. If even after Rousseau's allowances for their errors, parents still refuse the responsibility of bringing up their own children, they will be hard pressed to find a suitable replacement. Since as Rousseau says, to make a man, one must either be a father or more than a man oneself. It's only when he presumes that mothers and fathers 
the ones to whom the book is addressed, will remain unpersuaded by his exhortations that he introduces this tutor who is more than a man and assigns him this imaginary pupil, Emil. In doing so, he breaks off Emile's relations with his own parents, since according to Rousseau, a tutor cannot share authority with parents. So education must be either all familial or all tutorial. And only after this kidnapping episode, uh, Rousseau lays out Emile's curriculum. The curriculum, read from a disinterested perspective, which is the perspective that most readers have, right, is an instruction in overcoming the modern contradiction of the bourgeois, uh, but if you read it from the perspective of Emile's parents, which he presumably had, uh, and especially his mother, it's harsh medicine, depicting a world in which neither her children nor by extension her husband will need or really care for her. Uh, of course, given that she had little interest in raising her son in the first place, she might be unmoved by his indifference to her. But the long-term threat that the tutor educated Emile poses is not as her indifferent son, but as a man educated to be uninterested and unmoved by women like her, that is, as her potential husband. Perhaps then it was better to follow Rousseau's initial advice, which after all promised a way out of the bourgeois malaise. But Emile is rescued, uh, first in imagination and then in fact by a woman, uh, Sophie, uh, who happily embraces the conjugal and maternal duties that the mother in book one has rejected. Uh, she reestablishes the salutary sexual balance of power with a man whose need of women has been very nearly suppressed, and she convinces him to do precisely what Rousseau exhorts in book one, which is to educate his own son. Sophie thus shows the female reader in book five the way out of the crisis into which Rousseau leads her in book one. one can, uh, she can only do this because of the education that has made her sensitive to public opinion and social judgment. <laughs> Emile, by contrast, cannot educate his own children without Sophie's, and it turns out his tutor's help. So since Sophie's education is oriented towards society from, and motherhood from the beginning, she seems to have no comparable need of lifelong tutelage. It is Sophie who, in the end, knows the truth about modern society, and Emile who, to the end, remains in the dark about the roles of deception, manipulation, and domination in social life. Sophie's apparently oppressive education thus turns out to lead to some kind of real knowledge of man, whereas Emile's apparently liberating education ends in ignorance about man. Neither of them is fully free since, in society, since society requires dependence. But who is more free? The one who doesn't know how this works and is happy in his ignorance, or the one who does know but whose knowledge comes at the cost of the burden of negotiating it? Book five also raises another question. If Sophie's education is not strictly about the nature and constitution of women, but is also Rousseau's reflection on the practical uses, if not the philosophic consistency of Lockean education, is it possible then that Rousseau's education of girls is actually intended for boys as well? That seems to be the practical conclusion of the work. Or to put it another way, Emile's education follows the requirements of nature, while Sophie's negotiates modern social conditions. That's not to say that sex doesn't matter. Once man leaves the primitive state of nature described in the second discourse and takes up a sedentary life, uh, the requirements of extended care for children make sexual differentiation inevitable. Uh, for this reason, it seems that Emile could not be a girl, but Sophie could, with minor modification, be a boy. And such a boy would not dwell on dolls and adornment as Sophie does, but we actually have a pretty good idea of what he would do instead because Locke lays it out in his book, which he notes applies for the most part to both sexes. The education of book five might be superficially modified for boys, but in its fundamental orientation towards the will and authority and towards the goal of self-denial, it would be Sophie's. So while a division of education into male and female is consistent with Rousseau's arguments across his writing about sexual difference and its consequences, it's less clear why one education is impossible while the other requires little more than sufficient material resources and a conscious desire on the part of parents, zeal, uh, to achieve. It's also puzzling that given his criticism of Locke in the earlier books of the Emile, Rousseau finally endorses a Lockean education, but only for girls and only at the end of his work, while the bulk of it is occupied with inverting Locke's pedagogy for boys. If we follow the possibility that the book has two audiences, that it, there are the tender mothers, and there are the students of the human condition, then the difference in, practical, in practicability 
between Emile's and Sophie's educations may point to a different reading. It is after all mothers and not students of the human condition who desire a pedagogy and a curriculum that they can apply to their own children, while students of the human condition desire instead to know or to be shown how the natural in man can be disentangled from the social. And Rousseau answers both desires. In books one and five, he gives a practical Lockean curriculum, Lockean rules for education, and in books two through four, he gives an extended critique of Lockean education in the name of nature. By assigning Locke's education to girls, Rousseau does mock its effeminacy, but by assigning it to anyone at all, he also admits its value in confronting the modern problem, since whatever her philosophical shortcomings, Sophie is nonetheless not bourgeois. The education he assigns to girls, a moral education at home focused on cultivating self-mastery against the fashions of a corrupt society, can also be given to boys. And given Emile's inability to ultimately reconcile his natural education with the social demands of modern society, without continued deceptions and manipulations by his tutor and Sophie, it's by no means obvious that he, in the end, is more free than Sophie. Both of them must, know, must bow to convention and public opinion. Both ultimately deny themselves, but Sophie at least sees her subjugation for what it is and knows how to manipulate her masters in turn. So this is not to say that Sophie's education is the stable or ideal solution to the modern contradictions of the self that Rousseau is concerned with. Neither Sophie or Emile end well uh, in the fragments um, of the proposed sequel that Rousseau was writing. Uh, Rousseau's Lockeanism consists in his endorsement of the insular nuclear family as an antidote to the corruptions of modern commercial societies and the role that the intense, that in intensely personal authority of uh, parents <coughs> as pedagogues play in protecting individuals from degenerate public authority. But to read Rousseau as a straightforward, unconflicted Lockean would obviously be a very foolish endeavor. The great obstacle that he poses for liberalism is his hesitation about the prospects for liberty under modern conditions. And as a result, all his proposed solutions across his works to the problems of man's modern dependence and his weakness are ambivalent, full of caveats and disclaimers. And this is no less true of this idealization of the nuclear family uh, and of women's domestic authority that we get in Emil. Uh, the family, especially the nuclear family linked by ties of love, is a larger whole than the individual, but it's a much more mutable whole than the Republic, and one that even in the best circumstances has to dissolve within one lifetime. The risks of devoting oneself wholly to a unit so small are very great, as the sequel demonstrates when the untimely death of just one member, their daughter, suffices to unravel all the years of arduous preparation for one another that the characters underwent. Uh, you, there's a similar difficulty in Julie where even the most morally solid commitment to family gives way under the pressure of erotic longing. So given the need of reciprocity, love is not essentially stable and I don't think that Rousseau is arguing that it is. And the family as a result is not a permanent or thoroughgoing solution to the incoherence of the modern self. But it is at least a way out of the moral and intellectual slavery of fashion that arises in centers of luxury and commerce like Paris, with which Rousseau is very concerned. So not just the sequel, but also the ambivalent ending of the main text of Emile Merritt's consideration. The very fact that Rousseau does not claim that even in his idealized, even his idealized pedagogical authority can issue an autonomy ought to give us pause. The Lockean child has some reason to want to outgrow childhood, uh, but Emile's ending calls attention to the contradictions in this position, since even a child under a less totalizing and less selflessly devoted authority than Emile's tutor comes with, uh, even a childhood under an authority like that, comes with substantial pleasures from, of protection and care and does not clearly motivate a desire for the vigorous intellectual independence of adulthood which Locke hopes for. Why not continue to rely on the benevolent judgment of your father long past childhood especially given the difficulty of making your own judgments. So Rousseau depicts authority as both liberating in the way that Locke does. It can preserve us from falling victim to other potential sources of moral and intellectual slavery, but also potentially enslaving. The most perfect authorities that he depicts, the tutor and then the lawgiver in the social contract, are so compelling as to make it undesirable, if not altogether impossible, to, for those under their sway to achieve or even desire independence from them. 
Imperfect but functional authorities like mothers who compensate with zeal for what they lack in talent may hold our obedience less permanently, but even at their best, they're also less reliable and less able to bear up against normal human adversity. So Rousseau's concern to rehabilitate private personal authority against the power of fashion is not, I think, as optimistic as Locke's. Locke, too, had doubts about the power of human reason and the number of people who possessed it, but he was at least relatively sanguine about the possibility of protecting the freedom of those devoted to reason through his pedagogy. Rousseau could not, it seems, even endorse himself that far. Thank you very much. Well, we have a response from Sarah Goodstuff, who is a graduate student in the department. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, this really fun paper. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And um, thank you also for your great exposition of it just now. You've cut several pages off of what I wrote, which is always great. Um, very helpful. Um, it's been a little while since I read Emil in Death or Lost Education, so I'll just caveat that. But um, I found your argument very compelling, even in such small details as Sophie's name, which is perhaps just so obvious that we overlook it. Or the fact that the structure of Emil as a book has women literally holding together the structure of the book. They are keeping Emil, um, keeping Emil together. Um, rather than go into your argument and unpack it any further, because you've done it more beautifully than I could, I'm going to. Um, Go ahead and lay out some of my thoughts about implications of your argument, things that um, I could use clarification on. Um, and I'm going to steal one of my classmates' favorite idioms. They fall into a couple different buckets. This concerns the nature of the authority of the tutor and of Rousseau, uh, particularly connected to your um, pointing out the manipulation and, and deception that the tutor holds or, or engages in for a meal. Uh, the nature of sexual difference. And then um, parallels and connections to other liberals and the greater story you're telling about education, liberalism, the free individual, and I think also the free family. Um, so first, the authority of Rousseau. He's obviously not the same person as the tutor in the text, but he associates himself with the tutor. He's a kind of proxy. And according to your argument, what he is doing is to show, um, to show the, the, the profound limits of that sort of natural education. And thus, um, to show the limits of that sort of um, exercise of philosophy for, um, for the functioning individual in a, in a modern commercial society. Uh, you devote much time in the essay to the contrast between Lockean pedagogical authority and Rousseauian as represented in the Tudor and Neela relationship. But I'm wondering if this text is primarily, or, or in, in some significant way, educate, an educative text for women, does that entail a distinct pedagogical authority Rousseau exercises over women? Um, I ask this question because of how you flag the tutor as a source of manipulation and deception. Um, Emile is, from the beginning, subject to the manipulation of his tutor, such that his sense of freedom is always constituted in relationship to the personal authority of his tutor. Um, he may believe himself free, but in the end, he is practically not uh, from his tutor or from the, from the pressures of modern commercial society, such that he asks his tutor to essentially be his head of household once he starts having children. And that operates contra the Lockean view of authority um, as he well explains, um, Locke's child has always known authority and understands in what rebellion consists, such that he can resist the whims of fashion. Whereas Emile was, as you wrote, by, was by manipulation naivete subject to the tutor from the beginning and remained subject to the end. Um, if such a tutor did exist, which seems implausible by your argument, he would legislate for him forever. Um, as a slight aside, I think there's something really interesting here about the psychology of the tutor. Um, and even if he is not a realistic a realistic person. Is there, is there something to be pro or are they there? Um, hence the kind of irony of Emile's education that's not a problem for Sophie's, uh, whose education is more internally consistent, more conventional, and yet a source of her resistance to convention. To convention. Um, her education by no means leaves her oppressed or without the intellectual resources to choose, um, choose the constraints of her life. I'm wondering though, is Rousseau doing something similar with women as the tutor is doing with Emile, that is to say, operating in some kind of persuasion, compulsion, or or forcing her to be free in a certain kind of way. Um, given that this tutor can be taken as representative of philosophy, um, as opposed to the sentimental or moral education um, given by parents, that this tutor is a kind of proxy for Rousseau himself, um, that the tutor is guilty of a certain kind of manipulation. Um, and if we take seriously your claim that Emile's book aimed at women, is Rousseau in any way, yeah, is, is, is he in any way compelling women to be free along his dictates? Um, if your argument is right, then either scholarship or Rousseau himself have long deceived us as to some of the true content of his project of education. 
Um, so is your argument then the unveiling of that deception, or does your argument and unveiling what Rousseau is doing suggest he's fabricating some sort of um, new foundation for, for a moral family life for a commercial age? Um, you know, the Emil, uh, for Emil, Sophie is half imagined, and then she eventually becomes a real person. But for us as readers, she is literary. She is, she is not real, even if her education is vastly more real and practical than Emil's. Um, I would think Rousseau must have been aware of the difficulty that he presents a version of himself in the text as a tutor manipulating the young Emile at the same time he's looking to teach women something. Um, and you write that uh, both of them must bow to convention and public opinion, but both ultimately deny and both both ultimately deny themselves. But Sophie at least sees her subject, subjugation for what it is and knows how to manipulate her masters in turn. So perhaps Sophie or the female reader of Rousseau who who. Play, who, who, who sees what he's doing, realizes that she's reading a text. She's reading an argument. She's not being tutored. Uh, she's, in other words, being persuaded. Um, she's being persuaded and therefore would know how to persuade her masters in turn. And that's a lot of what political philosophy entails. Um, I would just posit that, uh, that the, the levels of, of deception and manipulation that you've shown in the Rousseau proxy towards Emile, if we believe Rousseau is teaching women in this text, means there might be might be some, some, some other level to take seriously. There's, I think there's a, a dark side to that, which is that he's compelling them to be free according to his dictates. And there's a light side to that, which is he's convincing them um, to, to choose this sort of education and therefore be free. I'm not, you know, the, the dark side and light side, whatever you want to say. Um, in relation to the tutor, I'd raise one further point. Uh, Emile's education in his hands makes him fit for the modern world, as you've demonstrated. Um, and what you again, it's Sophie, who in the end knows the truth about modern society, and Emile, who to the end remains in the dark. Um, if so, as you've said, uh, Sophie knows through her education more about politics and social life than Emile. It suggests the futility of a certain kind of philosophy and getting to the truth of things, but also in reforming private life. So in that case, why would Sophie's sisters end up reading Rousseau as sort of there's a kind of interesting premise that they have to already be readers of philosophy to be reading Rousseau. Um, the woman who's already engaged in that perhaps wouldn't pick it up. Um, but if Rousseau is setting himself as a, up as a kind of tutor to women, does that mean philosophy still wins at the end of the day over convention uh, and moral education? Um, these are just some things that were, I, I was posing to myself as reading the paper. Um, and then next, I'd, I'd like a little more clarification from you about the way in which this uh, educative project for Sophie and for families is given to all, or is in some sense for us all. I think you made things more clear in your presentation just now. Um, but I'm trying to understand whether Rousseau, um, the ways in which he does and does not end up eliding um, gender differences and the ways in which um, the autonomous and free man and the autonomous and free woman are in some way, the ways in which they are similar and the ways in which they are different. Um, thought one, Sophie's education is for us all insofar as women specifically receive this education and pass it along to their children through the family. Then the idea being that we all, regardless of our sex, benefit from this effeminate education because our mothers teach it to us. Or thought two, Sophie's education is for us all able to be given to us regardless of sex, not because of something about mothers or their special moral authority, but because of something about our common humanity in a feminized age. Um, thought one posits something special about the mother, thought two posits something about the age. Um, and so it's not to say that they're both, they're not, they're not incompatible. Um, I, think, I think your comments just now elucidated some of this. Um, but uh, I think, I think sex, sex matters, as you say, but it also seems to matter not too much. Um, and so if Sophie's, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm still asking how gendered is self-mastery in the face of the fashions of society? And if Sophie's education trains women, especially, but ultimately any recipient to be autonomous of the culture and fashion, what is the nature of the claim to female moral authority? Um, and then finally, I was, I was sort of struck, um, because I've been doing some, uh, reading in Adam Smith recently by parallels or, or similarities in, in, in focus um, between what you argue, Rousseau argues, and certain things that Smith says. Um, Smith's famous for his writings on women and the wealth of nations that describe uh, women's education as immensely practical in a way that men's is not. Um, and the trope of the, I was, I, I was sort of chuckling myself that the trope of the, the students sent to boarding school is common to Locke and Rousseau and to Smith. 
um, uh, despite Rousseau and Smith's differing accounts of sympathy or amour and divergent priorities in terms of economics and, and politics, it seems I would think they have, you know, they have a similar view of the centrality of the family or the household and of a particular kind of women's education um, and of moral education uh, in commercial society more broadly. Um, the family is, as you write, a precarious solution for Rousseau, but an attainable one. I don't think it's insignificant that Rousseau or Smith, despite their differences, have this ha ha have a kind of similar view on this. All that is to say, uh, liberal political theory tends to speak very much the liberal uh, speak very much of the individual and the state. Uh, but your paper gets to sort of the heart of what the French verb éduquer means, which is to raise as opposed to just instruct. Um, and then this collective project of education becomes a project of raising families that withstand fashion in a kind of collective way. Uh, your paper stays very nicely and tightly focused on the specific questions posed by Rousseau's reading and representing of Locke and pedagogy, but I have to ask you whether you think something has been lost in liberal political philosophy um, or whether liberal political philosophy would be, would be different um, if, if the conversations that were being had focused more, or focused in a, in a greater way on the oikos as a center of resistance to, um, to modern society. Questions? Thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed it a ton. Thanks, these are good comments. Should I answer or do we? Oh, well, please, I will. Oh, okay. Um, so the question of Rousseau's authority over women, what is he trying to do to his women readers? So actually, you know, there's like a whole reception of Rousseau's Emile, and you can read, uh, you know, uh, Madame de Stahl has written, wrote on him, and the most obviously the most famous one is Wollstonecraft, but there's all these other French readers, too, who respond to him. And from what I gather, I mean, I have not done an extensive survey of all of these people, but basically the reception was quite positive. Uh, so even though Rousseau is so explicit about how oppressive this sort of education is for women, he somehow has managed to persuade at least, you know, I don't. I guess it's really like six or seven things that you can actually find and read at this point, um, unless you start to go through archives and letters and things like that. Uh, so he's managed to, but he, you know, these are not insignificant people. You know, Germaine de Stahl is not just like some random person. He's managed to sort of persuade them that this is a worthwhile project while portraying it to them as an extremely difficult, burdensome, oppressive project. Uh, and so I think you're right to say that this is an effort. I mean, one of the things he says in book five is that, you know, in this sort of, in this day and age, you have to teach girls to reason. It would be better in a certain sense if that wasn't necessary, but given the situation that we're in, you can't just leave them to opinion because opinion is corrupt, right? And so then, in a sense, it seems what he's doing is he is reasoning with these women who he sees as being sort of unwilling to take up the burden of raising their own children. I mean, that, that seems to be the setup of book one, right, is to, to ask mothers to nurse their children and fathers to raise them and then to receive basically a refusal. Uh, and then you move into the story of Emile. Uh, so these women are sophisticated. These women are already in public life. And so how do you persuade them you cannot compel them to leave it. Uh, how do you persuade them to leave it and to return to this kind of very sort of constrained domestic uh, government? And I mean, I think, you know, he promises them power. And he promises them more power than they have actually in, in more influence authority, really, than they have in public life, where he says, you know, in public life, your authority is very diffuse. You're talking to a lot of different people. What, what men want from you is not something that you can actually give to all of them. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, see, this is an, argu it's a pers it's an argument that actually lays out all of the costs that are involved in what he's proposing, right? So he's not manipulating them or deceiving them in the sense that he's hiding from them how difficult it will be. And I think the endings of both Emile and Julie, which are terrible and tragic, right? I mean, he's, he lays bare that this is not a guarantee, right? Even though it's, it's a kind of solution to the problems that we find ourselves in, I cannot guarantee that by following this kind of pedagogy or this curriculum that you're going to find happiness and sort of domestic bliss or something like that. So I think that his very willingness to be blunt about it and to be honest about it is a kind of persuasive mechanism, right? That he's, he's saying to, to the female reader, you know, I'm not hiding from you what this would really require or what this would take, and it would take a lot. 
Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think it is an effort to persuade, and it's an effort to persuade especially the kinds of women who are influential in society who are already in public life. Um, <clears throat> do women have to be readers of philosophy in order to understand what he's doing? Well, I mean, these, reader, these women were. And there were women who were. There were, in fact, a lot of women who were. So it's not a preposterous thought to think that they, there are already women in, in 18th century France and England and places like that who are equipped to understand this. Um, <clears throat> the question, I think, about whether, maybe I'm, I'm not totally doing justice to all of your questions, but I'm, doing, I'm just going through what I have sort of written down. Uh, what does it mean to say that this education is for all, whether it's for all because mothers are giving it to everybody or it's for all because it can be given to boys? Uh, it seems to be the case that you have to, in order to perpetuate what the tutor has started, it has to go, it has to be given to everyone because how can Emile raise his own son unless by hiring this tutor who will take his son away from him, right? And that would undermine the whole project. So in order for Emile to raise the son, which he has coming, he has to sort of revert to the education that was proposed in book one and abandoned. Uh, and I think that's why he uses, Rousseau takes up Locke here. Locke offers the practical kind of education, which is a coming down from Emile's real education, the, the education of books two through four, but it's practical and it still achieves the goal. It's just not as self-consistent and philosophical. Uh, and you can give this, I think he thinks you can give it to boys and Locke shows you how. That's what Locke's thoughts concerning education are. Um, and then the comparison to Smith. Yeah, I mean, you know, Smith, Smith reads Rousseau. Uh, <clears throat> the, the interest, so I mean, for Rousseau, adapting to modern commercial society is only one option. For Smith, I think it's the only option, right? There really isn't an alternative good life out there that you could have in another regime or outside of regimes. I think Rousseau is more flexible on this question, right? And so he, he tries to offer ways to live in different contexts uh, without saying that somehow modern commercial society is the only one and it's certainly not the best one but it's the one we have. Um, and then whether something is lost because of the loss of the home, yes. I mean, I think that's basically the argument of the book that this is part of, right? Which is that early liberals, when they made this argument about why you should not send your children to boarding school repeatedly, all of them, uh, were concerned with something about what the home does and the way that authority is structured in the family that cannot be replicated outside of it, but it somehow seems to be necessary for preserving the freedom of individuals when they're adults in liberal society. And so that, I think, has to do with the personal authority of the family. And that if you don't have that exposure, that somehow you're, you're amenable to being very easily co-opted by everybody else in the society. Uh, and then what happens is lots of people who read Emile decide that we need to implement the pedagogy in schools. And that's, I mean, that's the Swiss, the sort of immediate Swiss response that becomes the kind of Prussian response. I mean, that, you know, and that's, you can see it in Dewey, right? Dewey, who on the one hand says, you know, Rousseau was the sort of the great philosopher of education. And now let's talk about democratic schools. Uh, and so they're just, I mean, there's obvious reasons why I think philosophers are, are inclined to turn to the school to, to educate because it's just a lot more efficient than counting on all these individual families to be able to do this. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, that it, it elides a really important distinction that Locke and, and Rousseau, and I mean, even Mill says something about this, right? There's a lot of people who are concerned with this problem, that the structure of the family and the structure of education should not look like the structure of the liberal state if you want to preserve freedom in the liberal state. Uh, and so we, I think, just don't think as much about that, although homeschoolers have brought that back uh, on a small scale. Well, thank you very much. I, I noticed you didn't mention uh, Germany as having the, this large public of readers for, 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 for Rousseau, but it certainly did for Emil. So it just occurred to me, I mean, the others here know more about it than I do, that Herder, when he was courting his wife, one of their letters uh, uh, said that they would bring up their children à la Rousseau, which... Uh, yeah. Well, you have to ask which which which, which way. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'd like to know more. Anyway, it's time to uh, to 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 um, open the discussion. And since we've got a diverse group, uh, it'd be, I'd very much appreciate if you could say your name and uh, you, where you, where where you're affiliated, and it'd be helpful to us.
Yes. Uh, Michelle Boston College. Thank you. I really love that. I, I haven't read your paper, but I'm really eager to to get because you, there was it was very rich and I and, and um, many interesting suggestions about the, the 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 immediate practical intention that Rousseau may have, whatever else may be going on in this complicated book. I thought it was really really interesting what you brought out and and yes, and certainly the ways in which the immediate oh this is you know unjust to Sophie reaction should be resisted um, and it what, um, what Michael. Rosen just said, when Kant, I'm reading Emile, one of the things he scribbles in his little notebook is, ah, this great, you know, this great book. Um, if only Rousseau had shown how to set up schools. <laughs> you know, you know, so you could you know, kind of you know, popularize this. Because if this is an education for an aristocratic child, and that's also true in, in Locke's you know, letter, that it's, a, you know, you, at least in the context of the time, you need to have means in order to so it only it really couldn't be democratized, mm -hmm. um, or at least it couldn't maybe until we're rich enough to have homeschooling as a as a kind of mass phenomenon. But that's that's neither here nor or poor enough, yeah. But. Or, well, but I mean, if you're really going to teach, I mean, to have fathers both working and mothers working around doing all the things you have to do on a farm, and also doing this, and also teaching your kid, you know, physics, it's you know, it's it's tough. It's a tough act, <laughs> and having twelve kids, at the, you know, so it's it's a tough act. Anyway. But I had just a few questions I wanted to ask you about. One was, well, and it, you know, on a practical level, maybe something like a combination of Sophie and um, and Locke's letter might, for some purposes, work. Um, there are additional criticisms, as at least as I call an Emile, on of Locke that that maybe you could say more about. One is the the moral critique that what Locke teaches is a kind of mercenary education. How do you teach your kid charity? Well, give him, a, you know, give him a prize whenever he gives a, you know, alms to a beggar, and and Kant is, yeah, Kant, <laughs> Freudian slip. Rousseau is absolutely against that. So one of the things that Emile's education and Sophie's as well seems to have that Locke's doesn't was this. It's a kind of exalted moral, you know, trans, transcendence of self-interest, which is aided and abetted by imagination, by a kind of natural religion, by whatever you do with the Savoy vicar. And the idealization that you know, Sophie may be self-interested, but she couldn't be doing all of this if she didn't think it was worth her while, because she, in a way, idealizes Emile. You know, at least at the early stages of their courtship, she thinks of him as, as a kind of divine figure, and all of that, which doesn't seem to have much play in Locke, and seems to be something additional that's needed—the kind of the romance mm -hmm. of Emile and Sophie. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about. Even on a very practical level, Rousseau's critique of liberal Lockean liberalism and not giving sufficient uh, kind of moral juice <laughs> um, that that uh, that you know that you would find, say, in you know a speech by Abraham Lincoln that you wouldn't you wouldn't find in, in John Locke. Um, so that 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 would be just one thing. And then just one other thing was he also seems to talk a lot about physiological differences between men and women. And that, although it may not have much imp influence on the raw state of nature, it seems like something real, and that men and it has mental implications. That men are capable of abstract thought, and maybe f further flights of imagination for good and ill that women aren't. Women are better at concrete details and so on. So that it's not simply that Emil and Sophie are interchangeable parts that could be given different educations. But he really seems to believe deep down that there are biological differences and mental differences that matter, which doesn't make one better than one worse. But I'm wondering if you, if you, if you just would discount that or, um, or think that, that that's an important element of the, the story. So that's all. Yeah, so the, the problem with the mercenary morality, right, that, yeah, he criticizes the way that Locke teaches generosity because, you know, he's, you, you give away your, your stuff, but you get stuff back. Um, I think that, that critique is actually an outgrowth of the critique of the will and and authority. So that, what I tried to do is distill, I mean, in all the places where, where Rousseau express, explicitly criticizes Locke, I tried to sort of distill what is behind this criticism. And so the problem of the mercenary morality is because the child, in, according to Locke, has to be taught to respond to praise and blame, right? Because he admires his parents, and so he's striving to please his parents, and so he's only doing things to please his parents. Right? That's the, the basic problem of the mercenary morality, or to please whoever it is that he's trying to please. 
Uh, and so he's not doing things for any other reason. And for Rousseau, I think Rousseau's point is that this is because he doesn't, he cannot really understand moral ideas and he's being introduced to them too early. And what he gets out of moral ideas is there are many ways to pursue my self-interest. And so, you know, for example, you misbehave when your parents are not looking. Uh, because really what, you're, you, what you want is your parents' praise, but if they don't see your, you misbehaving, then that's not a problem. You're not going to lose it. Uh, and so it, that, I think, is part of the, the, the two-part criticism of how Locke, Locke uses the will or misuses the will and introduces authority too early in order to make us sort of slaves to our parents and not... So you think Locke really is a moralist, too? I mean, oh. full-blooded... Yeah, so I, I think Rousseau is just, at, just criticizing him yeah. there for the, yeah. for the inconsistency in the way that he talks about the will and authority and that it's, it's self-contradictory if you thought it through, is what he's saying there. The question of whether Sophie demonstrates this kind of mercenary, mercenary morality if her education is actually Lockean, um, well, I mean, she does. She, she is very explicitly trained to admire and imitate her mother. Uh, and it's her mother's affection that she's striving for, and her mother, in turn, has to be a kind of lovable person, which is also a point that Locke makes. The stuff about romance, though, what Rousseau says about that is that Locke leaves that out, and that's a mistake, right? That's the very beginning of book five, where he says, at this point, you know, Locke abandons his pupil to marriage and then says the work is done. But I would never do such a thing because we have to explain actually how marriage is going to you know, take place and how the, two, the relationships between these two people who have these, these educations can be cultivated. So I think there, I mean, she, Sophie doesn't display a mercenary morality in the, in the way that, I mean, she, she has the same morality as Locke's pupil. The question of how that applies to romance, I think Rousseau's critique is Locke doesn't tell us. And it's not obvious. Right? What kind of a marriage is Locke's pupil going to have? Locke doesn't say. He just says, go get married. Don't get married too young. We have a custom of letting people get married too young, and you shouldn't do that. So wait a while. That's all he really has to say about it. And so it's the, the stuff about how you can coordinate human beings so that they can live together. I think Rousseau is criticizing Locke for not, not actually saying anything about that uh, and how to make them compatible with each other. And so that's why book five is this development in part of how you can create two human beings or educate two human beings who are compatible for each other. And that requires the romance that Locke, yeah, doesn't have much to say about. Uh, or this sort of higher idea of self-sacrifice and turning into sort of one unit and all of this stuff. Um, the physiological differences. So this is, I mean, if you look at the feminist literature on, on Rousseau and, and Emile, this is the, the central concern, is that why does Locke introduce these physiological differences where in the second discourse he says there are no substantial differences, right? Is he just making them up? So Susan Oaken spends a lot of time on this, right? She, she says he's basically just asserting them here for some unclear, basically misogynistic purpose. Uh, and it's, I mean, I think that, that um, uh, the, the, um, the, what's his name? The guy who wrote the book on the, the sexual politics of Rousseau? Schwartz. Joel, yeah, Joel Schwartz. I think his book is much better on this because he does make the argument that he's totally consistent between the second discourse and Emile and Julie and these other books that, that really sexually differentiate men and women and that these sexual differences are exaggerations that are necessary for survival in society and they're not natural. And they become natural in the sense that because we can't go back to nature and because we're sort of evolving almost or developing as a species, in order to exist once we, we adopt a sedentary lifestyle, we have to have sexual differentiation. And so we exaggerate the psychological forms of that differentiation in order to make it work. But they're not fundamentally natural in the sense that they exist in this primeval natural state of the second discourse, where, or at least where the second discourse begins. Um, and so, I mean, basically, I, I follow Schwartz on this question. I guess I, think I read Schwartz differently, but that's OK. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about that later. So they matter yeah. because we have to make them matter, because we can't get along otherwise. But in order, we're making them matter as a conscious decision. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a decision we're willing to accept these differences because we see that a kind of harmonious civil life can grow out of them, but not because they're there in us, driving us in some fundamental way. And I think Rousseau is trying to encourage us to, to accept and even to exaggerate those differences in certain ways because they make for a better, more harmonious domestic life. I'm Tom Cleveland. I'm at Holy Cross right now. Um, 
I really enjoyed that. So one thing that just occurred to me is that uh, I think he says that um, in book five that women like dairy products. Uh, and in book four, when he's describing what he would do if he had a lot of money, he includes that he would eat a lot of dairy products. So these, so these natural differences are not, uh, as you say, okay. entirely natural. I had not noticed that, but it's an interesting point. It's a male and female sold together. Exactly, right? So but that wasn't my question. I wasn't holding that back. As well. uh, um, so you, you had the... You s you said that um, the education is deficient in some way uh, in so for Emil insofar as he doesn't want to raise his own children. Well, he's not capable of it. Yeah, but is in what and but you also pointed out there's you know there's something nice about not having to raise your own children or wanting someone more competent uh, to do it for you. Or what exa why is that bad for him uh, not to raise his own children? I guess that's my question. In what way is that a bad education for him? And I guess I could add somewhat playfully that Rousseau is sort of on the record of... of oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, although he, there are people who claim that he didn't want that. That was the woman that he conceived those children with mm. who wanted it. Um, That's not his argument, though. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, yeah, well, why, why is it bad? It's bad in the, in the scheme of book one, right? Which is if the point is to reform society, which is, you know, he says the whole reform of society comes to, from the, right. this reintegration of the family. You can't achieve that through the education that is proposed as the, the correct natural education that's going to reintegrate the family. But yeah, that's why, that, that I understand why it's necessary for making society work, but why is it Good for why is it bad for a meal if he doesn't? Want oh to right, so there it's not right. So th that's okay. why I'm saying there's two. Right. Do you have in a sense two readers or two two perspectives on on a meal? Right. So if you if you try to think of the trajectory of a meal's education from the perspective of his mother, it doesn't look so good. But for us, it looks great because a meal's just a, an exemplary human that we might like to be like, or maybe raise our children, or right. you know have you know something like that. But um, no, from for the perspective of his parents, they totally lose him. Right. right, he's completely lost to them, and he's a kind of unsociable or asociable right. person at the end of it. So, from his perspective, you can say, well, maybe he kind of achieves what he, you know, what Rousseau sets out for him to achieve. Right. But from the perspective of any family that he would ever be part of, that's not such a good situation. Right. So, and just one small thing in addition to that, you also seem to say that the Emil and Sophie has was like a bad ending, but for Emil, from a certain point of view, he deals with it. And he's happy. He says he's not happy. Well, so in the beginning of the letter, he says, than, yeah, "Yeah." Then he says, "Well, I'm I'm starting to come to terms with it, or you know." But it's it's really hard to say what. So the first letter opens okay. with his, how unhappy he is, okay. and that how he unprepared for this unhappiness he was, etc. Um, so yeah, there, I mean, both arguments are made about the sequel. The sequel is a okay. really problematic thing. I try not to spend too much time on right. it for this reason because he says he does say both things. He says I'm okay. very unhappy, and then he says, "Well, I'm kind of coming to terms with this." Okay. Um, but we don't, also don't exactly know what happens with. I mean, he seems to remarry potentially, and actually, Schwartz talks about various okay. theories of what is going to happen in the sequel that other people who Rousseau talked to thought he was going to put into the sequel, oh, and okay. they're quite bizarre. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. I, I will just say I don't know okay. about the sequel. Good. Uh, um, well, I, 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 uh, I learned uh, a lot from this, as I always do from reading your stuff, and also as, as I always uh, react uh, when, I, when I do so, I, I feel I immediately have to go back and reread the book. Uh, so um, I, I haven't done that yet, but, uh, but I wanted to follow up on uh, Susan's question, because mine, I think, was in a similar... I mean, Susan was asking you about the physiological differences, and in a sense, I'm not so interested in the source of the differences, whether Rousseau thinks they're natural or... Uh, whether uh, they're, as it were, natural in civil society, which is uh, an important question. But I think the force behind her question, or at least uh, the force I'd add to it, is, is just uh, how counterintuitive it seems to me um, where you end up um, in, the, in the reading of book five. In a way, um, because the, the overwhelming emphasis, at least as I remember it, of, of that book, is on the necessary differences between male and female education. In other words, the, the whole point, and you know, attacking Plato for exactly 
mm-hmm. failing to do this, sort of just going on and on and on about how, um, the, the, you know, it seems as if the lesson he wants you to take away is don't educate these people the same. So in a strange kind of way, the claim that uh, we should be educating boys um, like, uh, like Sophie is less counterintuitive to me than the claim that we should be educating both boys and girls like Sophie. In other words, that, that what really, uh, which seemed to me what you were suggesting at the end, um, is that he's proposing obliquely um, a quite uniform kind of education, perhaps with some differences, as, as you say, but in essence, the same kind of education for both genders, which seems to run against the grain, at least, of, of, of what I took him to, to be uh, trying to leave the reader with in that book. And so I, I, I suppose that then led me to the, I mean, if that's right, and maybe I'm just misremembering, but if that's right, um, then uh, that leads to uh, a, a broader question that I had about the nature of the reading. Because in a way, there's a kind of esotericism here. That is to say that what, he's, what he wants you to take away, namely, um, in corrupt civil society, we should be adopting a uniform method of education for children and uh, irrespective of sex, and it's Sophie's, not Emile's. There's a question about um, why not say that? You know, um, because uh, certainly it's it's not a um, it, it, it seems to me to run against the grain of 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 what um, uh, of what uh, what the text is actually uh, sort of at least rhetorically obviously um, getting at, and that may be it may be that he has good reason to soft pedal this in some way. Uh, is there? Do you have a thought about? why he isn't more explicit uh, if this is actually where he wants the reader uh, to land? Because it's, I mean, he's leaving, if, if, you know, he's relying on you to do a lot of his work uh, in, uh, in helping us to see what he wants out of education. Well, okay, so I would say if, for one thing, right, that yes, he's, he has this whole tirade against Plato for, for giving women masculine educations. But what he's proposing is to give women, to give men feminine educations, right? So he's in fact going the other in the other direction. You're right to say he's in a sense doing the same thing, but he's going in the other direction, mm-hmm. uh, and it's for a feminine society because he sees sort of modern commercial society as a feminine society, mm-hmm. right? And that's how he explicitly describes it in the second discourse. So it, it's it's feminine compared to what is humanly possible, right? In the whole range of human life. But in terms of what is possible now, we all live in it, right? And we, can't, we, we can go back to a kind of more masculine sort of republicanism that I think he depicts as being, you know, more masculine. But we can't go back to the original state of nature where there's kind of almost no gender discri- differences at all. Uh, so unless we're going to some kind of Spartan option or, the so, you know, reinventing it in the social contract, we're living in a feminine society. And we're, we have to prepare men for it as much as women. Uh, and it's not a uniform education because it's a family education, right? So if you think through what it would entail for people to undertake this, everyone's education would be quite different. They would be, it would be the same in some sort of general principle. So we, you know, we inculcate self-mastery. We expose children to the dangers of public opinion from an early age. We subject them to the authority of parents. But those are very abstract principles, right? What you actually do will have to vary by family. And that's part of the point, for Locke especially, right? Is that you create this kind of internal diversity in a liberal regime that makes it harder for people to just be assimilated into one kind of public opinion. Uh, So it's not, it's uniform in a sense, but it's uniform only at the level of very abstract principle. Uh, And then in reality, what it would take to implement it is you would have all these families, and families do things differently, especially when they're isolated from one another as the, you know, the, the education that Emile gets or, or Sophie gets there sort of in a rural area, then it's the same thing for Locke. You have to do this in a rural area. You cannot do this in the city because you have to be isolated from the rest of the influences that would otherwise creep in. Uh, so I would say those two things are sort of caveats. Why not make it explicit that, you know, what, what he's saying is that I think because he's partly it's a criticism of Locke, Right, and so he's not. I mean, if you if you see it as in part a criticism and in part an endorsement of Locke, you know, there's no point in saying, well, what I really want you to do is give your children a kind of Lockean education. But what I'm going to show you here is all the problems with the Lockean education. I'm going to offer you a kind of corrective or perfection of 
the Lockean education for the, the most, the biggest part of the book. And then in the end, I'm going to come back down to Locke's education. Uh, so I think, I mean, you, to, to make it explicit is, it would be sort of, I don't know, it would just sort of undermine the whole book. Well, I'm writing this book that begins with the argument, after Locke's book, my subject was still entirely new. But actually, I'm just saying, do Locke. That, that in a way wouldn't make sense, right? So you have to set up why you need to criticize Locke, why you need to correct Locke's contradictions, and then you end with what, what is available for, I think, anybody who has read Locke to see is Locke. And it's very simple when you see that, that, that you see, okay, well, Locke's education is for boys. When Locke wrote it, it was for boys. So if what you're endorsing for girls is what Locke endorsed for boys, then at the very least, you have to think it's possible for boys, right? I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing to say, well, Locke's education was good for Sophie. Well, but not as, I mean, it wouldn't be quite as weird to say Locke's education is OK for girls. Uh, it's inferior, uh, and girls have to be uh, educated differently because of all the things he says in book five. Uh, but boys have to be uh, educated but then what's, in some what way is that goes beyond Locke. Right, so well, that, then you raise well, so, you know, what is for boys. The, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. But what would a mother but, think I mean, is for the, boys? But the, but the issue is, um, well, anyway, um, I know there are other people who want to ask you. Things, yeah, so but, I think uh, that the it, difficulty sort of, here is what would the mother, what could a mother educated the way that Sophie is educated possibly teach her son? That would be different from essentially what Sophie or what really what Locke proposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be for boys because they're going to have boys. Well, so Otherwise, then, you have to so start then, again with the new. What do you make of all the hand waving then about how the one thing you must not do is educate these people in the same way? I think it's to draw the, the or to draw attention to the distinction between, on the one hand, Emile's education, right, and Sophie's education. That these are really two different approaches, but it's not so but clear. But you shouldn't adopt the two different approaches. You no, you should only same. adopt the second one. Right. If you're actually going to adopt yeah. something, yeah, you should not. You yeah. should not try to do Emile. Yeah. But Emile is important philosophically, right? Because Emile shows you that in a way you're going to fall short if you try to give it, your child a totally natural education, and maybe that's okay for a commercial society, mm -hmm. because this is not a, a perfect society. Um, so I think it is the lesser education. In that sense, it's still inferior. I think, though, if you thought through, well, what, what could mothers teach their children if they were educated like Sophie, it's not really clear that there would be anything for boys that would be a home education that's available in, in the book other than the, you know, Sophie's education, modified slightly, obviously, less coquetry and all that stuff, and dairy products. <laughs> I'm Eric Bierbaum, the Department of Government and Social Studies, and it's my first question is very much a follow-up to Eric's, which is um, the the way we, I found this paper to be gripping, I should say, really exciting. Uh, but the the way you arrive at um, so Sophie's parenting as the as the parenting for future sons is a kind of cross-elimination argument, right? There's just no one left, and I guess I just wonder. Uh, yes, there, it would be strange, you might think, if, if there's simply a missing parent at the end of this. But at various points uh, in Emile, Rousseau reminds us that neither Emile nor Sophie are particularly naturally uh, gifted. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of harps on that. And so perhaps he's just, I mean, he might just be ruling out <laughs> two kinds of forms of parenting for uh, this, uh, this particular uh, market society. And why, why would you want to rule out that reading where simply it's a cross-elimination, but you have to look elsewhere beyond the text? I mean, that's another way to read it that doesn't make uh, Sophie's parent, parenting the default. Uh, there might be better parents out you know. So, so that's the first question. Um, and then the second question, I, I was thinking more and going back to Susan Okun's movie Western Political Thought, because I agree, of course, she spends a lot of time worrying about Chapter 5 and the natural differences uh, that are being invoked. Uh, but she spends, I think, almost as much time on uh, s something where I think, I mean, you're kind of allied with, with Susan when you raise her worry that uh, Rousseau uh, treats the family as a natural kind, family affection as a natural kind, uh, and that goes against the second discourse. You say, well, that was, that was intentional. And then you say, well, but the family is functionally natural, right? Um, and I think that seems, but it seemed to me that, that moment where you're changing with, with Oaken, she would agree, I think she could agree with that, right? I mean, what I think that, um, so I want to test to see where you disagree. And I think here's an example where Oaken writes, um, Sophie um, has received the ideal education for her sex. But then 
open says, but she's doomed. Now you could, of course, the question is she's received the ideal education for sex for which society, right? Uh, for uh, the society that exists, society that ought to exist. Um, and, uh, and that, so the second question then is, is there, is, is Oaken right, is, is the reading right? Uh, if you're training women for the society that Emil uh, is being trained for, what would that education look like? Would that also be a uniform education? Oh, yeah. uh, as an implication of your I'm trying to fill all the boxes in mm -hmm. this matrix, right? And I'm saying, here's another missing character. Uh, the uh, education for uh, girls in a, uh, a society that doesn't and almost certainly won't exist. Is that also going to be uniform as well? Mm -hmm. So I thought those kind of worked together as questions. Um, so when you say, why, why rule out better kinds of parenting that are not discussed in the book, and then you say, well, be, Emil and Sophie are both kind of average people, do you mean like there could be a sort of different education for the brilliant child or something like that, and that, that Rousseau just doesn't show us that? So I think the, the initial question is meant to be separate from that, to say, uh, say I just like a reason why he hasn't just ruled out two forms of parenting for the, the present uh, corrupted time. But then I was trying to add as an extra possible hypothesis, perhaps uh, what you need is people who weren't, I mean, I would actually suggest that the picture of Rousseau, Sophie and and Emil below average. Uh, it's, it's not even Lake Wobegon, right? It's kind of they're they're sort of both um, under uh, kind of under. They didn't, you know, on, on, in the natural lottery, they didn't do great. They didn't. So, well, what are the two parent, two types that are ruled out that you're referring to? I, I in this current world, with the way markets are, et cetera, that one should not raise one's child either uh, as Sophie is raised or Emil is raised. Oh. Um. Well, so the, what Rousseau says about, you know, he says th those who are sort of not, you know, there, there's a certain percentage of children who educate themselves. They're sort of unamenable to education. So to be brilliant is apparently by definition. And Locke says something very similar. He says, you know, like this is for nine out of ten and one out of ten just educates himself. Uh, and so it seems we do not need to concern ourselves with this, this type potentially because it's, there's no... Education is not really a question that we can raise about them. Uh, <clears throat> the, the question of education, other kinds of education of girls that could be found in other kinds of regimes. So the way he describes education in other kinds of regimes, so the, the Constitution of Poland talks about education. Um, and, and there, I mean, that's a kind of regime analogous to the social contract. Education is completely public. And nothing is said about girls specifically, right? And so it's, it seems that, yes, being in a different kind of regime necessi necessitates a completely different approach to education where you have sort of salutary public mores. There's no problem with public education. In fact, that's the only good option, right, is something like Sparta. But when you have corrupted public mores as in a sort of, you know, modern commercial society, then you have to actually completely have, you know, take to invert the education entirely and make it totally private. Right, so the family is really diminished in these, these sorts of social contract type regimes. Whenever he's talking about that kind of a republic, the role of the family has to be diminished because it actually detracts from civic sort of the, the whole citizen. Right? But in a modern commercial society, the role of the family has to be reasserted because it actually strengthens the individual against the corruption of the society. And I mean, where, where girls fit into, you know, for example, the stuff on Poland, he just doesn't really mention them as far as I remember. It's just education, presumably for boys. Um, so he has other accounts of education actually in his own writings. And that's the reason that I emphasize that Emil is written for a modern commercial society and it's a kind of solution or offers a kind of solution to a modern commercial society. I only mean that. It's not Rousseau's final word on education or his argument about the kinds of families or educations that would be possible in other regimes. I mean, he's just much more flexible in certain ways than, you know, Smith and Locke, who talk only about one sort of regime possibility in a certain sense. I don't know if that, that fully answers the question, but... It, it absolutely does. But, but I, I guess the only last would be whether... Um, would you agree that Sophie has received the ideal education for her sex? I mean, is, is that is Oaken right when she... No, because it's the ideal education for her sex in a modern commercial society, right? It's the best possible thing for Rousseau, but that's not always the best thing, right? But it is true that when it comes to the education of women, he doesn't have much else to say about it elsewhere. That he has other things about education generally. Yes. 
Um, I'm Dimitri Helikas. I'm a graduate student this department. So just, um, so you had said, uh, uh, so yes, yeah, so this is what you had said to, to Sarah, and then in that response just then, that Rousseau is kind of flexible. He keeps open this possibility, these other sorts of regimes, where other sorts of educations would be possible. So then the criticisms of Plato, um, Plato is educating men and women for a very different sort of regime, right? And so then do you see in, in, in the sorts of criticisms that Rousseau makes of whatever mistake Plato is making uh, in, in that education, in that educational regime, does that tell you something about what the ideal sort of regime would be in a different kind of uh, social circumstance? Because there it seems like he's sort of, he's using, he's sort of plugging in the platonic criticism as a stand-in for criticism in commercial society almost in a way, which seems strange, right? If, if he is really keeping open this, this flexibility of different sorts of educations available in different sorts of regimes. Well, okay, so as I recall, the criticism of Plato is in book five, right? It's not, it's not where he's giving a more abstract philosophical account, right? So um, it, my argument is that book one and book five are really the ones that are addressed to women, right? And so the, the, the argument, you know, you cannot educate women to be like men is an argument at, aimed at women, or you should not try to educate women to be like men in a modern commercial society, because that's where he's addressing them, right? He's addressing his contemporary readers. And it's, you know, a lot of people, so th most scholars, when they read Emile and they try to say, well, what regime is Emile for? They conclude he is for the social contract. And that's not totally wrong to conclude if you're only looking at books two through four. Right, that the education broadly, you know, of Emile is an education for a citizen who is going to go found the social contract. But then in book five, it turns out he founds nothing like the social contract. Right, he even rejects. I mean, citizenship. He's always sort of minimally a citizen. He accepts that you have to, you know, sort of accept some obligations, but basically you just go out in the country where you can do the most good. Uh, and so it it seems to me that the 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 way that he addresses Plato or, or he brings up Plato is to argue to women that you shouldn't try to, to sort of to create a masculine education for women. But everybody actually needs a feminine education because the society you live in, if you understood it correctly, is a feminine society. And unless you're going to live in a different regime, which is not an option that he gives in book one or five, uh, you're, you're, this is what you're stuck with. Uh, it is, you know, when it comes to, you know, one question I think that's really interesting is why when he talks in the, the, the Constitution of Poland and in the social contract about the kind of public education you should have in a good civic regime, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't address the platonic question. Right, well, what about with the women? So Sparta doesn't give public education to women. Maybe that's the default, but I don't know that that's sufficient. I, I have to say that I have exactly the same uh, reactions as Eric that uh, I found it incredibly interesting and provocative and I really need to go back and look at the book again. So uh, if I could ask a question which, you know, I'll ask a question, if you tell me I'm wrong, uh, then probably I won't say anything more. But the, 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 uh, I'll, so it seemed to me, sort of on you know, my inherited reading of the, of, of the text is, well, um, the Rousseau is giving us uh, an, uh, an account of how uh, boys and girls should be educated differently because they have natural inborn differences, uh, but also because those natural inborn differences are associated on the one hand with reason and the other hand with feeling. And you're saying, well, actually, the real uh, source of the difference is that uh, the, the education for Emile is the education for someone in isolation from society and uh, the um, education for uh, Sophie is for someone who is living in this society. Have I, is that a fair? Um... Yeah, well, I, I say the education of Emile fails because it tries to, to sort of harmonize them both, and in the end, that's not very successful. But the thing that but I... But yes, it sets out with the natural education that's going to somehow make him livable in society. But am I wrong in thinking that that Rousseau thinks that there are some natural differences associated in one case with reason and the other case with feeling? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, he's yes, yes, yeah, he's, he, no, no, yes, yes, he does say things like that. That that uh, you know, so he gives this analogy. I think it's that uh, the the man is the, the the woman is the eyes and the man is the hand. Is that right? When he opposite. makes this analogy, isn't that opposite? is it the, is it the opposite? Well, it, it isn't. It isn't because uh, the, the 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 executive uh, kind of function of the hand, uh, he's active. Um, and where she is uh, observant and sensitive. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that is the way. I don't know. Maybe somebody else remembers it better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are there seem to be some kind of cognitive the various co there's a difference in cognitive strengths. But then he does say, of course, we have to educate women to reason now. So it's not that they're utterly incapable of reason, but it's not their strength. Well, there, there are two things then that so. I'm, I'm going to go back on this. I'm really sorry that I haven't had time uh, 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 because if I'm right in my memory, um, it seems to me that this is one of the most fascinating bits of uh, Rousseau because, uh, you know, if we look at the second discourse, we see so many things saying, oh, you know, we mustn't rely on reason. Whereas this is a book which is trying to bring reason and feeling together. So the, the you know, the thing that, uh, the, the, why, what, 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 it seems to me differentiates Emil from Locke is that both uh, Emil's education and Locke's education are working on feelings, but they're working on a different account of feelings and a different uh, and a different uh, attitude towards feelings. So Rousseau is uh, it, Locke is basically trying to kind of behaviorally modify feelings, whereas. Uh, uh, it's a vulgar way of putting it, and an anachronistic one. But Rousseau is trying to find a way in which the feelings will be natural, and then harmonise with reason. So, and and so the whole book, as I take it, is uh, Pace Nichols Dent is against amour propre. It's about trying to get away from the artificiality and vanity of amour propre. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so the message I take it, to, maybe I'm completely wrong, is that Emil. Uh, is going. We, we can. We reason and, and feeling will come together so long as as, as Amor Proffer doesn't get in the way. Now that that brings me to book five, which is um, you said uh, that uh, you know Julie's the one living in uh, opinion. She's in a society. Sophie. Very, uh, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Sophie is is living in in, in, in opinion and and, and uh, she's a, living in a society of opinion, and that's the society. We're going to deal with. Is that just then a capitulation to amour propre, or is there perhaps something less threatening about uh, opinion in the case of women and the family than there is in the public realm? I don't know. Why? Why? What's, why? Why shouldn't we be worried about um, Ju uh, Sophie's education uh, being corrupted by amour propre? Um, well, I, you know, actually, I don't think that he talks about amour propre in book five. Is that? Am I wrong to say that? My memory is that he talks about it in relation to Emile in book five. But yes, yeah. right. But he doesn't, he, it's not raised with respect to Sophie. So, I mean, I think that's the reason we're not concerned about it is because she's, yeah, she, that is a con concession to Amor Proper. But that, that's part of his criticism of, of Locke, that he, he exacerbates this problem. But then it turns out that actually, in practice, this kind of effort to, to achieve self mastery as the, you know, Emile achieves self-mastery in book five. He accepts that. He says, at the very end, you've got to learn how to master your own will. And that's bizarre because we've just spent four books talking about why we should not be doing that, because we shouldn't have a will that requires mastery in the first place. Sophie has to start, has to do it from the beginning. So it seems that, yes, yeah, she's tainted by Amor Prop. That's the whole basis of her education is to always to see herself as other people see her. But also she's taught that that's a kind of lie and that you need to, you need to know what yourself is uh, independently of how other people see you. And so that's what he has this line about how you have to test opinion against your own conscience. So she develops this conscience very early. Emile apparently doesn't have this problem because he's not concerned with other people's opinions. But so I think that that's the crux of it, right? That why is that there? Why would he, after all of this, this discussion about the problem of opinion, just educate somebody who he claims is enslaved to opinion? And I think the answer to that is because she has a Lockean education that inverts all of his criticisms of Locke, but the point of doing that is to show that actually it's functional. It's just not philosophically consistent. 
And I wish I had the text here, but the, 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 the thing that I remember so vividly is uh, where he says, you know, it's fine for um, Sophie to dissimulate, because mm -hmm. uh, feminine dissimulation, pretending that she uh, isn't attracted and, that, you know, and, and denying her, mm -hmm. her, 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 her natural impulses, which she has just as much as, uh, as, as Emile does, uh, you know, that's actually a good thing. It, that, that, that this is feminine modesty and, and, and it is a good thing. So my hunch is that, this is what I was trying to put, press you towards and uh, hoping that you might be able to confirm this, is that there seems uh, to be something more threatening about amour propre in the case of men than uh -oh. it is in the case of women. Well... Yeah, I'm not exactly trying to answer that. I mean, it seems that he wants, it's, it's a question of whose opinion you are subject to. So he would like Emile to be subject to Sophie's opinion. And he, by this point in his moral development, is capable of being that. And so it's very important to control Sophie, I mean, in the sense that to shape her as to be a person whose opinions will not corrupt Emile. Does that make sense? I don't know if that, that well, makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. But she's in a society where... You know, feminine modesty is uh, is, is 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 regarded as as, as as important, even if it's a society in which that's in a certain way a sort of you know noble sham. Um, so I was thinking, well, maybe it's the you know the public, commercial, political side of society where the sham is more um, <coughs> corrupting, or yes. perhaps it's the the, the 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 you know the kinds of simulations that male men are forced into uh, that are more corrupting. Uh, well, not dissimulations, sort of vanities that men uh, adopt that are more corrupting. Um, well, certainly the, the public commercial society corrupts mores, right? And so, yes, whatever, who, the, the kinds of so he, he criticizes, for example, men who try to please these salon ladies. Exactly. Um, and so, but that's because their authority is, is poorly developed. I mean, they have this authority because it's a kind of sexual authority, which like is an appeal that is, is basically, it's hard to ignore, let's put it that way. But it's not, sal it's not morally salutary, right? So it, since men are kind of, I mean, this is also, I mean, I think a point that, that Joel Schwartz makes, that men are open and women are not as open for Rousseau. And that's also why you can't go the other way, right? That you can't say Emile could be a girl. Because if, a, if Emile were a girl, then she would have the possibility of, of having children, and that would just undermine the whole thing, right? Whereas, so, but Sophie could be a boy. And so the, I think there is an openness of men that Rousseau thinks men can become all kinds of different things, and women cannot become so many different kinds of things. And they're limited by something that is, in this case, physiological, but it's like really literally physiological, which is their ability to get pregnant. Uh, and so, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm sort of going in circles around your question. I'm not totally sure what, what you're trying to get at. But yes, yeah, certainly men who encounter women in society are corrupted by those women. They're always under the influence of women. The, so the, the goal becomes to make women better influences. Well, and I the think. only thing that's going to make them uncorrupted by women is when women become masculine, according to Rousseau, and then they're, they're no longer sexually desirable. So they're, then men are free. I guess I was heading towards the idea that the family might be, you know, to <laughs> adapt a phrase from another political theory, the heart of a heartless world. Yes. Uh, well, that, that becomes a suggestion, but it's a, an unstable suggestion, and so he accepts that it's, it doesn't work all the time. But yeah, that, I think that is where he's getting, where he's trying to push women towards. Uh, and he thinks men will just go there. I mean, one of the interesting things is that he reveals, well, he reveals all this stuff about women's power over men, to what you must imagine must be a very large male readership, right? And so, you know, he's also telling men, at the same time that he's telling women a bunch of things, he's also telling men that women are controlling you, that, you know, they're using their wiles to, to have power over you and, and all of this stuff. And he doesn't seem to think that this is going to be a problem for the future of his project, because he thinks, I think he thinks it's irresistible. It doesn't matter if you know rationally that it's happening. Well, so, okay, maybe I should clarify this point. It's not a gender-neutral education 
in our understanding of a gender neutral education, right? He's not saying, look, everybody just goes to the same classes and they all participate, they go to the same locker room and they all do gym together and all this stuff, right? All I'm saying is it's gender neutral in the sort of the underlying principles, which are about the will and the imposition of authority. And then you can differentiate the activities. You can, you know, they can be physically differentiated, right, where, where girls and boys do not spend time together in their education, but that the, the underlying principles, which is that you introduce authority from the beginning and that you, you sort of subject the child to opinion so that the child learns to overcome and negotiate public opinion, that's the gender neutrality part because that's what he doesn't do with Emil. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, you, know, I, you should call I, people. I was not quite convinced by your argument until that, that bit. And I thought it might be stronger if you said something like, in order to do, or just repeat what you already said, I'm repeating what you said, which is, in order to do Emile's education, it really has to be, you have to go wholesale and, uh, you know, treat him not like you're his father, but like you're like his buddy. Nobody is possibly going to do that, right? No father is actually capable, or mother is actually capable of raising their child in that way. So therefore, they're going to act like mothers and fathers, which means they're going to impose authority from the beginning. Therefore, the principle has to be, it has to be the Sophie principle, if that's all you're, say, if that's all you're saying. Uh, well, I'm saying not only will they not do that, they should not do that. They shouldn't try. Well, he, he has lots of repetitions throughout the book. You shouldn't just try to do this halfway. If you do, right. this, if you, if you do this halfway, it's a disaster. Yeah, that's right. And so... Yeah, so but let's you continue on try, anyway. You should, that no parent is going to successfully actually treat their Well, he like says that, that this is not the sit. job for a parent. What, right, what the exactly. tutor represents yeah. cannot ever be represented yes. by a parent, right? right? And they're not going to find, so it's going to have to have this other principle. Yeah, so I think, I mean, maybe, I don't know if this clarifies because this seems to be sort of your confusion. When I, I, I don't mean gender neutrality in our sense of gender neutrality, which is like a thoroughgoing and complete one. I mean, if you think about the letter to Donald Bear, right, when he talks about the circles in Geneva where there's a really kind of strict separation of the, the social lives of men and women, and he, he talks about that very approvingly. That's not saying that men and women are the same. It's just that if, what I'm talking about is just the principles that underlie Emile's education uh, are not practicable, and the principles that the the really fundamental principles that underlie Sophie's education are practicable and can be practiced on boys. So can you just say what? So what? So what's the point of books two through four? <laughs> to show that these are not so philosophically this is a different consistent. Task. This yeah. is a different task. This is not practical. This is what you should do. So what? And that's that's a huge and elaborate. So I'm not doubting that there's a point. I'm just trying to understand what you think the point is. Yeah. So the point of books two through four is to show what a, what a natural education, which is what Locke sort of says he's trying to do, would actually require. And it's not what you should do to your children. It's just a philosophical sort of exposition and untangling of the contradictions that he finds in Locke's education, right? But then because it's not something that you can or should actually try to do to your children, there is still a kind of moral reform project underlying the, the book as a whole. And that moral reform project, I'm arguing, is really in books one and five. So, but things like the Savoyard Vicar had huge, huge yeah. influence. And they weren't just exercises in, you know, kind of a thought experiment for philosophers. So is that But part Sophie of has a different religious education. She does. But and it's Lockean. It's like, here's a I basic I know, but creed. you don't think that had any, he had any desire that that would have some kind of practical, immediate. Well, it, 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 it have certainly an, did. It should he have an effect way, on the way you think about religion. Because the Germans just went crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. but if, if you say, well, books two through four are a kind of, are, are really a kind of philosophical <laughs> argument, uh -huh. right? Then yes, yeah, so the, an argument about the, you know, for the basis of natural religion should make you as a reader think about natural religion, but it's not really in the context of any particular education, right? Whereas for Sophie, her religious education is actually part of her education in exactly the way that Locke's religious education is. It's like a curriculum for a child, right? Whereas reading the, the profession of faith of the Saviour of the Saviour Vicar is not, it doesn't really have anything to do with educating a child, although it's framed in book four as part of Emile's education, but it's a kind of thought about, you know, you know, theodicy and what is, where does, you know, how do we fit in in, this, in the world? What is the role of God and all of this stuff that anybody could think about, right? And not as just a kind of catechism that you're taught when you're seven about God made you and God is watching you and all of these sorts of things. So I think if you read books two through four as a philosophical exposition, that's just, it makes sense that it's part of, that it's there. 
and that the religious education that's given to Sophie in book five is really a kind of school school book She's education. basically told whatever your parents think, that's what you should think. And yeah. you should think whatever your husband thinks. Other than this thing about, you know, what your grandmother died, right. and clothes are getting outgrown, and so, yeah. Yeah. But it's very, it's very know, close minimal. to what Locke suggests, except for you sh the stuff about thinking what your husband thinks, because Locke, of course, doesn't say that. But if you look at what what he's telling the what he's telling people to teach Sophie, it's very similar in this kind of catechistic, your basic tenets of religion. You should believe them. Here you go. They're prepackaged. It's not about you thinking through your own. The reasonableness of Christianity food. doesn't make any difference. Hmm? The reasonableness of Christianity doesn't make. That's any not difference. what Locke says in the education. Right. But, but he meant it to have some... But you write different books, yeah. right? So you write different books for different audiences. And I think the, the education is straightforwardly an education. Locke's education, that is. It's a curriculum. And he intended it to be tried. And it's pretty difficult. Uh, but it's not as difficult as Emile in books two through four. And I think Locke is just more straightforward on all of these points. You know, when he writes a book on education, it's really a book about education. Well, I mean... To, uh, <laughs> Susan rightly says the Germans did go crazy. I mean, it's just amazing uh, the the influence. And you know, as I understand it anyway, books two through three, four were read as being um, about right feeling, and you know, the, 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 as opposed to you know, a caricature Lockeanism, which which says just basically, you know, we have some social ends, we'll uh, we'll we'll, we'll further them, set up the initial conditions and the incentives right, and good things will happen. Uh, right feelings are ones which are much more complex and more profoundly rooted in uh, individuals. So, and that then leads people to the beautiful souls, for instance. The beautiful souls is this circle of people. You know more about it than I do. No, but, I don't. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway, correct me when no, I, no, when no, I no, go no, wrong. No, but, no. you know, they, 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 this, is, this is run by women. Um, women are not, uh, do not have access to higher education. But it includes in it, um, you know, mostly higher class, higher um, young women and men, and they corresponded with one another in very high-minded ways to discuss one another's feelings. And particularly, they were sort of a marriage bureau. They were trying to sort of figure out who was best suited to whom. Uh, so that was the kind of you know, the resonance, of, obviously not just of me at Neil, but very much of. of um, <laughs> of, of uh, Julie and, uh, and the Nouvelle Héloise, um, you know, to try and uh, produce idealised, purified forms of feeling. Um, and the idea that feelings need to be purified, um, that had this enormous resonance, and I don't think you get it in... It's, it's not a Lockean education no. to try and get to sort of purified feelings. No, yeah, that's right. And maybe that's a bad way to read Rousseau, too, to, to decide that what you need to do is then go purify your own feelings. But well, uh, many, that, many that, strange readings of Rousseau, that's but, probably but surely, not the strangest. But, but surely it's not bizarre to think that one of the, the, the good things about, uh, you know, the, the, one of the gripping things about books two to four is you get a vision of purified feelings. Ones that are purified not in the sense of being platonic and sort of above the world, but purified in the sense of being, in Rousseau's sense, natural. Yeah, that's right. You mean purified in the sense of Kant? <laughs> no, actually. No, no. And, maybe I can say and also in aesthetic education, which is, which is politically healthy, as opposed to merely luxurious. I mean, that's an important part of Meal's education. Yeah, before. that's right. And, sure, and, and, and so he gets a little bit of that because they trade books. But that's also kind of beyond Locke, I think. Uh, well, the books that he gives to, to Sophie are kind of good Lockean books. Doesn't he give her, uh, uh, what are the, the, eight, the English tracts, the, um, the spectator? Out of the things. spectator. Yeah. But then they trade. Then, but then, yeah. he, then she gets Fenelon. the other one, the Phil, you know, the Fenelon. Fenelon. Fenelon, yeah, which is this kind of high minded Christian, somewhat Christian. I mean, it's, it's more than Locke. I, I don't know. It's very, your thesis is very interesting. Um, yeah, you, so Sophie's education is more than Locke, or Emile's is more well, than Well, in Locke. other words, it, 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 Sophie's education is, it, 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 I mean, it matters that Emile, the, the boy that she falls in love with has had the education from books two to four. She didn't fall in love with one of the boys that was educated by her mother's friend, and that's an important part of what it means to show 
lock what he got, what he missed by not saying how a courtship has to come about. In other words, you can't take two perfectly Lockean figures and say, okay, court, and, you know, expect anything, any sparks to fly. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I think that's right. I think yeah. that that is one of Rousseau's criticisms, yeah. and there's not, I mean, yeah. you know, Locke doesn't have exactly an answer to that. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, So maybe that's Neil right. will have more to do with the education of sons than it seems. I mean, because she's supposed to be the nurse, but he's supposed to be the the teacher, and so maybe what he learned about, you know, remember the stuff in the forest where they figure out how to, how, how to get around, yeah. and that was actually a clever father who, who thought that up, and you didn't have to be a philosopher. Sure, but if you think yeah. about it, right, those things yeah. are, are doable, Yeah. but the tutor, the figure of the tutor and the way he relates to Emile is not, it's not replicable right. by any But there are re remnants of his education from books two to four that he could replicate. Yeah, no, and I don't think that that's, when I say it's, it's gender neutral, I don't mean right. that you couldn't do things like that, right? But you also could kind of do them with girls. Uh, I mean, that's, one, that's the point that Locke makes, is that, you know, these kinds of educative it's devices. They're morally uplifted in a way that I don't see Locke providing for. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, I, I have no problem with the idea that yeah. Rousseau is criticizing Locke. He is criticizing Locke, and he's trying to show his shortcomings and his contradictions. All I'm trying to say is that he's, it's not a thoroughgoing criticism of Locke because he capitulates to Locke a great deal in Sophie's education, and that the reason he does that has to do with the practicability and the structure of the family. We've covered an enormous amount of ground. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Rita. It's sure. been a real pleasure, and if I may say so, an education. <laughs> For both sexes. <laughs> For both sexes, yes, indeed. <laughs>